Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Voth. That is Derek Young, and we are here on a Friday, ready to preview a matchup that hasn't happened in almost a decade and a half. It's K-State and Colorado meeting on the football field, uh, because don't forget, folks, they played in the weird COVID basketball season. So uh, it'll be a little bit more recent in people's brains when they play on the basketball court uh, later this year or later this season. This year, it will not be this year. It'll be 2025 by the time they're playing each other. But for football, it's been a while for the Cats and the Buffaloes. And this might be the most interesting K-State Colorado game for some time. I mean, if you go back and you look at the the history of those games, uh, the last ones that were played weren't all that fascinating because those were two god-awful teams for the most part. Uh, a lot of Ron Prince and uh, Dan Hawkins to to make things go for you. So that's not the most exhilarating thing. But I think a top 20 K-State team and Deion Sanders and his pool of five-star talent makes for a pretty intriguing matchup, especially when it gets that 9-15 window on ESPN where everybody's going to be winding down from the day and they're going to want to watch a football game again. And who do they have? They've got K-State and Colorado, who is a ratings big-time getter. So uh, this is a big opportunity for K-State to kind of silence any doubts that people have after the BYU meltdown because – I think going into this game, that's really the biggest story here. It's not necessarily that you're playing Colorado, even though their talent meshes into this a little bit. I think this game could be at Arizona State. It could be at Arizona. It could be at Colorado. It could be, at, you know, if you had played somebody else and you're going to BYU now, we've already seen them fail a post nine o'clock central time start on the road and get kind of engulfed by the flame of the environment in the moment. They have to prove that that doesn't happen again against Colorado because I think we know that overall K-State's the better team here than Colorado. At least that's the perception right now. Now that could change depending on how Colorado plays against K-State. But going into it, that's the thought. And these are the games where it's more so about you taking care of your own business. K-State didn't do it against BYU. They got to do it against Colorado. And just, and I know a lot of us differ, of course, um, just judging by the Big 12 power rankings. But the comment that I'll add to your you know, beginning statement there is that, in my estimation, Colorado is better than BYU. So it could be even more of a challenge because of that. Just because I think they have more difference makers, a little bit more punch on offense, of course. Um, will it, I bet BYU is a better environment, but I bet they're pretty comparable. But I think... On a neutral field, I would expect Colorado to beat BYU, not not handily, but but beat them. So the challenge is is just as great, maybe greater. So the, <laughs> excuse me, K State has to be on their their A game, or has to play close to an A game, I think, to win. Unless they just come out a blaze of fire and Colorado kind of just wilts right out of the gate, which I wouldn't say is a non-zero. It probably is a non-zero chance of that, but. This is a four-quarter game. and Kansas State will have their hands full. Yeah, and I, I I agree with you. I think overall I would expect Colorado probably neutral field to beat BYU. Um, and, and that's, again, it goes back to just how frustrating and how long that BYU game is going to stick with people. At least, hey, here's a positive for everybody. We haven't talked about that game against Iowa State at the end of last season for a, a while now because it's been replaced by the uh, crap show against BYU. Um, but that's one of those things where you didn't really get the opportunity to actually see what BYU's real offense would have looked like against K State. Like that, and that's the thing where I think people trying to evaluate BYU right now would have to say it's kind of incomplete. Yes, the record looks good. Yes, they have a really good win over K State, but we don't actually know what they look like because they played SMU in a downpour when SMU is really struggling. Good news for them is SMU looks like they figured some stuff out now. Um, but K state obviously gave two touchdowns, non-offensive to BYU. And then they gave them like 35 yard fields to work with uh, the rest of the time that they scored. So you don't really get a good feel for what BYU would look like there. Colorado is going to test K state there. There's no doubt about it. Like, Colorado can have 80 yard fields all night and there's a good chance that they capitalize and score on well over, you know, three quarters of them. Like they, they're that explosive. They're that good. And they're playing a K state defense that really has to come through and prove that they can handle uh, a team that has a competent passing game and obviously fantastic receivers uh, like Colorado has. 
two things. One, Colorado is even more dangerous right now than what they typically would be because now they believe you're you're playing them when they have the probably the peak of their belief. And teams that start to believe or are confident can be the most dangerous ones, especially in an environment of that kind. Two, what I will say about BYU and why that game is just so bizarre, I don't want to call it a fluke because apparently that's a touchy subject for BYU fans, yeah. but BYU scored 38 points, and they did it on only 240 yards of offense. That's it, only 240 yards of offense, and three for nine on third down. So, I mean, BYU's offense didn't blow the – didn't – blow Kansas State away even when at least when they did not have a short field yeah yeah so in Colorado they're they're gonna have the ability to do it now I think there's a lot of concern about obviously Shadur Sanders is one of the best quarterbacks in the Big 12 statistically there's no doubt that he's the best quarterback in the Big 12 he's got the volume and he's got the success with the volume to back that up everybody knows about Travis Hunter there are other weapons that can be used in this Colorado passing game it sticks with me because we've seen the K-State secondary really struggle uh, in quite a few games now this year with being able to handle being attacked down the field. They, you know, it's weird. We give them a lot of credit, and I think they did a good job against Arizona. Tedero McMillan still had a massive night, but they they didn't let the Arizona receivers get past them. They kept everything in front of them. They forced them to continue to try and make plays. Early against Oklahoma State, that was not the case. That was not the case against Tulane, uh, and it was not the case against BYU. Even though the defense was backed way up, they had the short fields, made it tough, BYU was still scoring like two plays on them or less sometimes in those situations. This is the th- That is the matchup that is going to define what happens in this game. If, if the K-State secondary plays like what people had in mind at the start of the season or close to that level, then I think this game favors K-State. But – if they don't step up, this this is going to turn into just basically Avery Johnson's going to have to go back and forth with the Colorado offense and try and match them. And K State's the one that's going to have to be playing catch up in this game. Yeah, that's not their formula. That's not that's not the recipe that they that they want. Um, that that's why I've kind of said it a few on a few different shows this week uh, here and elsewhere is an issue this year that, that until Kansas State turns into a consistently reliable passing offense that is super potent. And I don't know if they'll get there this year. Um, I think they will be by next year. And maybe they will. We'll see. Is that Kansas State, can, we kind of saw this at BYU, they can kind of be game scripted out of games. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's I know that's the popular term now, game script. But it's absolutely true. Because if you go up, you know, by the middle of the game, two or three scores on K-State and force them to get away from the running game even a little bit, then you're winning, right? Because if K-State doesn't feel like they're able to run the ball because of what the scoreboard is and the time that's left on the clock, you're taking away their best asset. So that's why I say I think K-State can be game scripted out of games. And and, and I don't – I like Avery Johnson. I think he's going to get there. But I don't think he's there in terms of being able to just take over a game and win it 100% basically with his arm. And I don't know that the receivers are there. Like it's it's more of a conglomerate there, uh, a combination of the passing attack, whether it be Avery Johnson, the offensive line, the weapons, and cohesion is just not there. So they can be game scripted out of games. And and I agree uh, that pass offense from Colorado is a threat, especially when we can take into account how K State has looked most of the time against the passing game this year from a defensive standpoint, what I would do, because I'm just looking at the numbers here, and we'll see if K-State even has the ability to do it because obviously they've had some gaffes and flaws and miscommunication breakdowns in the secondary, is it's not a sexy way of doing things. Don't get me wrong, it is not. And people will probably be pulling their hair out seeing K-State operate this way. But I would just take everything over the top away and and look, and Shador Sanders is a very, very smart quarterback. He's actually, people think that his reckless persona off the field would translate to on the field when it's actually the opposite. He's one of the more careful, smart, high IQ quarterbacks there is in college football. And there's nothing even close to that. Go look at his interception numbers. They're nearly non-existent, especially at home. So 
if you for if you take away everything over the top and force him to kind of dink and dunk down the field, he will do it. He has the discipline to do it. He's not afraid to do that. Um, he will take a gamble and throw an ill-conceived ball. But if you let him do that, yes, they're going to march down the field rather easily, right? Dinking and dunking to the 20, to the 20, 25 yard line. But I think that's better than giving up a passing explosive on one play. So I would do that. And then I would try to clamp down in the red zone because you know what it's harder to do in the red zone? It's harder to throw the ball in the red zone. You know what Colorado doesn't really want to do that works in the red zone? Run the ball. So I would just try to make it a red zone game, especially when Colorado's an offense. And we've seen, oh, I mean, over the years that K State, that's where they they kind of thrive. And even this year, they've done a good job about that. I mean, you think about the two lane game, they were able to to kind of step up when the field got short there and make it a little bit tougher on two lane. But again, you have to be able to put yourself in that situation, which goes to what you're saying. Maybe the approach should be defensively. Um, same type of deal against Oklahoma State, where the the field got short for the Cowboys, and we saw them have to settle for field goals or miss field goals. Um, and Arizona, I mean, now that, that was a totally different deal. That They were just kind of put in a position where they were never really uh, allowed to even get down there. But they they did get big chunks of yardage. They just then ran out of room for the 50-yard bombs to, to Tedero and McMillan. So uh, I agree with that. Now, we've talked a lot about the negative already to start this. Is there a best matchup for K-State in this game? Is there an area where you think – K State has a significant edge. I mean, maybe because maybe, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but will we consider it a pretty big advantage for Colorado given their passing game versus K State secondary right now? So, what would be the inverse of that that favors K State in a big way? We're still talking about K State defense versus Colorado offense, right? You can you can take it any way you want. Well, I would say Colorado. I think has a fake stat going their way right now and it's run defense because they feel really mighty and pride prideful about themselves based on what they were do, able to do against UCF. But then I watched UCF play Florida and I watched UCF the week before in Colorado when they played TCU. Now they scored some points obviously in random ball. I just slowly but surely I'm I, there's a lot of luster for me anyway that's going off of that UCF win. Uh, even if it was in Orlando. So I I think Kansas State's going to be able to run the ball as long as they don't get game script out of it. I think that's a big – and I'm not sure if it's a plus, but they need a plus on the defensive side of the ball. They have to win the line of scrimmage, uh, whether that's getting home with pressure when you only send three or four or whether that's taking the run away when Colorado chooses to do it, which they don't choose to do it a lot, but they have picked it up a little bit in the last two or two games. So I don't know if it's an advantage, but they have to be able to control the line of scrimmage on the defensive side of the ball, especially when you're kind of giving them the, the passing game already. And even if you do the Dinkin and Duncan type stuff, uh, if you de- if you, if you want to go that route, that means you're putting a lot of guys in coverage, right? And you're putting a lot of guys back, which means you need to get home with pressure when you're not sending as much blitzes. Um, and if that, but if that truth too, uh, obviously he couldn't have failed, and obviously you just send the house at some point. But offensively, I think you have to start fast, and you got to run the ball because if you don't start fast, then then obviously you can't run the ball as much. Well, and the other thing to to know about this game involving the run game for K State is if you go and look at Colorado against the the mobile quarterbacks that they have faced this season. Um, North Dakota State starter Cam Miller, the quarterback, was their leading rusher. He had 81 yards on 16 carries for two touchdowns. If you go and look at the game uh, between UCF and Colorado, um, K.J. Jefferson was not the leading rusher. He missed that by a yard, but he ran the ball for 76 yards. And then Sawyer Robertson had 82 yards on nine carries when Baylor. Those guys aren't nearly as mobile as Avery. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. So that is an area, too, where the run game, could be at its peak, and, and that's one of those things that I have kind of leaned into where I, I think we probably are going to see a, a good amount of Dylan Edwards in this game. It only makes sense, and I think that coming off of the bye, this might be the week where we could possibly see some of the little, I don't know, interesting tweaks to the offense that includes more of all three of those really good runners 
uh, and and see how they can really kind of get a defense on their heels. So I'll be interested to see how they utilize, obviously, the legs of Avery Johnson. And then you're going to give the ball to DJ Giddens, you would probably hope, anywhere from 17 to 20 times. He's kind of right around that average this season. Let him carry the load and then find ways to get Dylan Edwards involved. And I would think that you're probably going to try to use all three of those to your advantage and use this as the game where we're really going to throw you off and do some things to kind of trick you and and go from there. So I'll, I'll be fascinated to watch that. But the the quarterback run game thing is important. And it's also needs to be said, like Connor Riley has to actually go out and attack that because we talked going into the BYU game, the BYU was not very good at stopping the quarterback run. They had struggled with that through their first couple of games of the season. And K-State didn't really use it early in that game. Now, you can say that those first couple of drives were still successful if you don't have those penalties, but at the end of the day, they did end up getting behind. They kind of pressed, and they didn't use it, and then by the time they did go to it, they found success with it. just didn't matter because they were too far out of the game, and like you were saying earlier, they were kind of scripted out of the game. So I think if you see a weakness there, you got to go use it early. I mean, they, they did it against Texas Tech last year. Like this staff – they know it when they see it. They can they can put it into practice, but they actually, I think, have to have the conviction to go ahead and do it, and uh, you can worry about some of the other things that you want to try and do later. If you think that can work, go with option A to start the game because this team has to play from in front, like you were just saying, and it kind of helps dictate the rest of the game because, I mean, we think they punch in touchdowns like they were driving and probably should have those first two drives in Provo. We're not talking about them losing that game 38-9. to nine. I think we're talking about them winning that game by multiple scores. So go out there, punch Colorado in the mouth when you get the opportunity. Do not try to go and say, "Eh, you know, we could we could throw our best pitcher in game one of the series, but we kind of want to save him. So in case we get down the line and we have to go to a game seven, then he can pitch game two in game seven. No, give your best shot right now. Knock him out. Go from there and, and see what happens. And if you have to go to plan B, you have to go to plan B. But use plan A before you use plan B. Start of the game is key, for sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we move on, good time to remind everybody that K-State will be starting the 2025 football season overseas as they go to Dublin, to Ireland, to take on the Iowa State Cyclones in the 2025 Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Game tickets can be secured now through a travel or hospitality package. All-inclusive travel packages include premium game tickets, luxury hotel accommodations, and exclusive K-State welcome experience and more. Game day hospitality packages include premium in-stadium hospitality with food and drinks and premium game tickets. Don't miss out on the trip of a lifetime. Book your package now at cats2ireland.com. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. We slide into best bets for the week and a uh, reminder of how everybody did last week. After we both went 3-0 the week prior, we both went 1-2 this Ooh. past week. <laughs> it was... Uh, Kind of, uh, you know, not really close uh, on the two the two whiffs because Missouri and Tennessee were kind of the laughing stocks of college football this past weekend, in addition to Alabama. And then Louisville lost by seven at home to SMU, so the, the spread was flipped on them. And then Penn State, they grinded to 27 points in their victory. But then our, our only wins of the week, boy, were they easy wins because Tedero and McMillan – just, and, and Noah Fafita, they were just throwing the ball all over the place on Saturday night as they trailed by 15 points the entire game to Texas Tech, and it that, was offense that's where, was going that's, nowhere. That's where game script helps, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, well, this one's going to be a pretty easy hit. And then uh, Oklahoma State, a good call by you. Uh, no game involving Alan Bowman or Garrett Rangel or anybody playing quarterback for Oklahoma State is going to see 66 total points in the game unless the O State defense gives up 63 of them. Yeah, that was an easy easy bet. I hope everybody tailed that one. Yeah, uh yeah, that, that I look I we should be monitoring everything that involves Oklahoma State moving <laughs> forward and I'm sure that we will. Yeah, the uh, markets haven't adjusted on them for whatever reason. Yeah. All right. So 8 and 10 for DY, 10 and 8 for me as we head into week 7. Uh, so, you know, we're 18 and 18 as you combine them together. Here is what we have for this week. First off, I got to tell you, great call on Iowa because you sent me your picks earlier in the week, but I didn't look at them like I normally do. So I went through and I was like, here are my the, the three that I like. 
And then I was thinking, what are the chances that he would have Iowa minus two and a half on there? And I opened up the email and it was the very first one that you had. So I was like, oh, okay, all right, I'll go find something different. So uh, I went to the other side of the Cyhawk rivalry and I've got a little Iowa State play that I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, but I'll let you uh, defend your picks first with Iowa, Kentucky, and Pitt. I think, well, one, the Big Ten teams that have cr- traveled across the country in general have been awful. They're, what are they, one in seven out, right? I think someone had that. So that's one reason to like Iowa. And then I think we're probably getting a little bit overinflated on Washington. I think they beat a pretty pedestrian Michigan team last week. And I think Iowa's just solid. Their offense is actually better than it's been because they have one of the best running backs in the country. The problem is their defense is not as good as it usually is. So it's, they're a little backwards there. But I think it wouldn't surprise me if they covered pretty easily. Kentucky is just a fade Vanderbilt spot, to be honest, coming off that big win against Bama. I don't really love Kentucky, and they're not a team really built conducive to cover large spreads, and I consider 13 half a large spread. So I, um, I'm supporting them this week as well, go Kentucky. But uh, I don't feel great about it because there wasn't a whole lot I felt – there, there was a lot I felt okay about this week, not a lot that I felt great about. Feel great about Iowa. Feel great about Kentucky and a fave Vanderbilt. But I feel great about Pitt. I got it at two and a half. I think it is three now. But Pitt minus three. Look, it doesn't matter if you get two and a half or three, in my opinion. This could be a 20-point game. Cal, again, a really really good fade spot on them. They just had college game day in Berkeley. Um, the ultimate meltdown in the fourth quarter against Miami. So they're... Their hearts are broken, and now they got to what fly three thousand miles. I don't know the number. They got to fly across the country to Pitt, who can really score. So give me the Pitt. Yeah, that's uh, I, I see. I see what you're doing there. You're playing the schedule element of this. Uh, who was it? Somebody was complaining about schedules recently. Uh, in the the travel involved. Oh, it was James Franklin. Uh, did you see James Franklin's complaints on realignment and travel? Uh, I mean, I get it. I mean, I one stop complaining though. Like you guys made your bed. The Big Ten wanted more money, so this is what you did. But two, I mean, we said it at the time. Like all these teams got to fly back across the country, left and right. You're going to lose games because of it at some point. Uh, James Franklin, for those that aren't aware, complained about the fact that because the state college airport isn't, I guess, big enough for them to to handle their flight cross country, uh, they have to heaven forbid drive 90 minutes to get to the airport in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, to, to make a flight. And then I guess they're leaving on Thursday now instead of Friday, which, you know, I, I don't know. I, it, I, that's one of those where if it goes well, teams might start to consider if you make those, those bigger trips, Hey, maybe we should consider getting in there a day earlier and kind of adjust ourselves to get where, whatever the environment is and getting used to just sitting around and basically doing nothing, for a full day and then going out and testing ourselves with our intensity and everything else. Especially especially those teams that have two or three of those in a given season. Like Kansas State's actually one of them. We just mm-hmm. had BYU. Now they get Colorado at night. Both games, what, 9 o'clock Central time. Mm-hmm. And then they got to go play West Virginia, the farthest flight of them all, the next week. And that's a night game. So does Kansas State at some point consider going on a Thursday? Who knows? Yeah, uh, I would say that they should start considering it if they don't win this weekend. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I've got a game that involves a big flight. Boise State going to Hawaii. Look, Hawaii <laughs> sucks big time. Uh, and Boise State has Ashton Genty, who's just been running all over people. They kind of they they know what they're doing uh, in terms of trying to run things up and just blow the doors off of everybody. If you go and look at Boise State, uh, their games this season, they beat Georgia Southern by eleven. That that looks like the outlier. On yeah. Boise State's schedule now, they almost took down Oregon on the road in Eugene. They blasted Portland State. They beat Washington State by 21, and Washington State is still getting a handful of love. And then they beat Utah State 62 to 30. Uh, I don't think that the flight is going to be a struggle for the Broncos. I think Hawaii's that bad. Uh, it also helps that if your team is based on being successful running the football, I've got a greater faith in you of going on the road and just being able to do what you need to do to blow them out. So I've got Boise state uh, with a three touchdown spread there. I think they cover that. Uh, Yeah. And then Oklahoma plus 14 and a half. Look, this is a, 
this is just a blind faith and playing history here. Since 2013, only two games in Red River have been decided by more than 14 points. Um, and this is also where Oklahoma's defense has been pretty solid. Like, that's not the weak spot for him. Quinn Ewers is coming back off of his injury now. So, like, is there going to be any rust there? And this is just a game, like I said, it's historically close. And more times than not, for whatever reason, I don't think it's necessarily true, but it feels like the better team typically loses this game. Um, it happened last year, obviously. Oklahoma won the game last year. There have been games yeah. where the worst Texas team has won that's finished like 7-5, and five, and then OU is at the end of the year 11-1 and one and, and playing in a, a Power 6 bowl game. Um, so I, I think that this is where I'm just blind-faithing Oklahoma for all these different reasons. And uh, it very well could turn out poorly because Oklahoma's offense sucks. Yeah, I'm on that one too. I'm just afraid that it turns out. What was it? Was it 22 that it, Texas won by like 50? Uh, yeah, I was I was looking it up uh, earlier today, just going back and kind of taking a peek at some of the history. Uh, the score that you're thinking of was OU won 49 to nothing, or Texas won 49 to nothing. And then if you go back to uh, 2012, um. Oklahoma won 63 to 21 and then 2013 Texas won by 16. So like there have been some massive lopsided games in this rivalry, but for the most part over the, the last decade plus it's been close. I think it probably will be again this weekend. And then since I couldn't take Iowa, I didn't want to be the same. I didn't want to put two Hawkeyes right next to each other. Uh, I said, you know what? Let me just go find a different part of the corn state. And I went and grabbed Rocco Beck because <laughs> his rushing total for the game against West Virginia is six and a half. And I know what a lot of people are probably thinking. You're like, okay, well, Rocco Beck really isn't a scrambler. That is true. Uh, very little, if any, design runs for Rocco Beck. Uh, in games this season, he has eight yards, three yards, seven yards, nine yards, and 28 yards uh, that he's had. The key here is, though, Rocco Beck rarely gets sacked. He's only been sacked twice this season. In his last game against Baylor, he had three runs for 28 yards. So he will take off if he needs to. And if you go and look at what West Virginia has done against quarterbacks this year, every quarterback has ran for at least eight yards on them. And again, that's including sack totals, which, by the way, West Virginia has 11 sacks this year. So it's not like they're just, you know, they're at three sacks and they can't get the quarterback. They have 11 sacks. Every quarterback has gone over that number by at least a yard and a half except for last weekend with the two statues that are don't know how to throw a football on Alan Bowman and Garrett Rangel. So uh, this is kind of my little cheeky play right here of Rocco Beck over six and a half rushing yards on Saturday, and I cannot wait to follow along to see if Rocco Beck rips off a script. This is like a Big 12 tournament last year when I bet Ali Khalifa in the first game. I think, was it over like four and a half or five and a half points? and very first like minute of the game, he launches a three uh, from straight away and drills. I'm like, okay, this is going to be easy. And then we had to wait and wait and wait. And I think he ended up making like flagrant foul free throws that got me over the number. Uh, so this is very much the Ali Khalifa. I'm just trying to be uh, sneaky and out outsmart everybody. So Rocco Beck, if you're looking for some fun Saturday afternoon. I'm not following you on that one. I can't, <laughs> can't say it. No, I am. I'm looking if I have an Iowa State West Virginia bet at all. I don't think I do. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, let, I'll just go in here and uh, let's see. Uh, I'll just I'll rip these off for you real quick so you have an idea of where the rushing totals sit for uh, opposing quarterbacks. Drew Aller ran for 44 yards on West Virginia. Uh, Burkett, the Albany quarterback, he ran for eight yards. Uh, against the West Virginia Mountaineers. And then in the game against Pitt, uh, Holstein ran for 59 yards. Now, these guys are a little bit more of the scrambling type. Jalen Daniels, 11 yards uh, he totaled there. So I, there is numbers to back this up, and uh, I can't wait to see it now. I, I do a parlay every week with my former comrades uh, at – uh, my previous stop before here, and I sent a text this morning, and I said, how do we feel about Boise State minus 20 and a half or Rocco Beck over six and a half uh, rushing yards for my pick? And Alec, who now covers Iowa State, was like, 
nope, I can, I'm not comfortable doing that. I do not like that at all. So I might be on an Island here, but I think this is going to be a fun one to follow along for everybody. It'll be fun <laughs> for somebody. It will be. All right. Uh, let's move on now and we can jump into the big 12 scoreboard and take a look around the big 12. Uh, oh, oh, go I ahead. Just, I was just thinking, it kind of reminds me of what team was it last year where it was like they they were playing Michigan and their total points was like one and a half. Oh, or was it Indiana? Indiana? Yeah, I think it was Indiana. It, it, was, it, was, first before, it was it was before the Texas Tech game. We were watching it in, in Amarillo. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yep. I Yes, I do. I remember that now. Yep. Indiana was the, yeah. Might have been six just, and a half total or something. Yeah. It was it was low and they were just zooming down the field. Uh, yeah, good good call. Oh, real quick, uh, for our K-State best bets, I'm taking Dylan Edwards plus 125 to score a touchdown. Uh, revenge game, and, you know, you got to do it. And then you may be kind of thinking the same way because uh, your pick was K-State to score a non-offensive touchdown. Yes, and that was at plus 450, I think. Yeah, so it, do you think it's Dylan Edwards that does it, or do you think the defense gets one? It could be. Not uh, both. No, I was gonna say could be uh, the thing is Schneider Sanders takes too good care of the ball. I gotta yeah. go to special teams. Yeah. Okay. All right. There you have it. Big 12 scoreboard time. Taking a look around the Big 12 this weekend. Here are the Big 12 standings heading into week seven. Uh Texas Tech surprisingly leading the way at three and oh, and then everything falls into place from there and how it kind of continues on. Uh, here is a look at what we have coming up this weekend in the Big 12. First game up on Saturday, or, well, not Saturday, but Friday night, Utah at Arizona State. This might be the most fascinating game of the weekend. And this is this is a really good weekend of games in the Big 12 for only having five of them because yeah. every game, could you could make a case that it goes either way. But this is one that Arizona State, one way or the other, could probably be frisky. But we're going to be playing the Cam Rising waiting game again. So if Cam Rising doesn't play, this is where you think this probably shifts to Arizona State probably being the better team and more likely to win at home. Yeah, it'll be interesting uh, with Cam Rising. They are a much different team with him than without him, obviously. The line keeps making me think he's going to play. Is it back down to four and a half? Because it started at three, three and a half, then ballooned up to eight. So I was like, oh, he's playing. Is it back down to four and a half for real? Uh, yeah, I think what I saw today was that I can go get a, a, a confirmation and a current line for you as we sit here at whatever time. Yeah, it's four and a half right now on so FanDuel. It's doing what it did uh, a couple weeks ago when they played it, Oklahoma it State. Yeah, when it seesawed back and forth. So it'll be interesting. At the end of the day, I don't know if Arizona State could score enough. Yeah, uh, and Utah's defense has still yep. been pretty solid throughout the course of the year. So and you think about what Arizona State wants to do, while they were a little bit more explosive in the passing game against KU, they really just want to give it to Cam Scadaboo and let him just overpower guys. Right. Utah is much better equipped, one of the better teams in the Big 12, to handle kind of shutting that down. I mean, I, I kind of think, based on where things are trending right now, like K-State's one of those teams that obviously they would rather see a team that wants to run the ball than throw it. Um, like next week, the matchup with West Virginia for K-State's defense obviously far more favorable than the matchup with Colorado this week for K-State. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, again, I worry about the Sun Devils because you put up the Utah defense against an offense that is generally one-dimensional, and I worry about that offense. Uh, I think Arizona State covers, and if Cam Rising doesn't play, Arizona State's going to win the ball game. So, be nice. forks up. Uh, the next game on the schedule, let's just get it out of the way because – it is the loser of the weekend. Nobody cares about it. Cincinnati at UCF. The Knights are three-point favorites, surprisingly. Uh, even though Cincinnati's gotten off to a decent start, they've shown they can score now. And Brennan Sorsby is one of the better quarterbacks in the Big 12 right now. I, I did this with Drew the other day. We were talking about Avery Johnson and all these other quarterbacks comparing him to. This is what the, the QBR leaderboard looks like in the Big 12 right now. Sawyer Robertson of Baylor is at the top, and Brennan Sorsby is number two. Um, he is far better than Emory Jones, and I did not give enough respect to Brendan Sorsby going into the season. I, I think I think Cincinnati wins this game. If the, if Cincinnati plays like the team that they've been all year, and UCF plays like the team that they've been for like the last month, I think Cincinnati wins. I just worry about Cincinnati building a lead 
and then losing it because UCF has already come back from a 21 point deficit this year against maybe a team that's not as good as Cincinnati. But Cincinnati lost like a three or four touchdown lead at Pitt. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so Cincinnati's not been great at closing out games. Uh, same against Texas Tech, even though then they tried to come back and then backwards close it out, then it worked out for them there. Yeah. Uh, so we'll we'll see how it goes. Uh, another fun game to follow along out in the mountains, Arizona on the road at BYU. The Wildcats already have one win in the state of Utah this season. Um, they've got more, you know, wins in Utah than they have uh, against power opponents at home this season. Uh, what do you think of the Cougars being four point favorites here as the number 14 team in the country now? Uh, I, I would take Arizona. They have a, they can have a dynamic and explosive offense. And I think you, maybe I'll be wrong. And do I use, I'm probably BYU fans probably hate me at this time because I'm the most skeptical on BYU than everyone. But I just, I wonder how real their defensive success actually is. And if it's what I think it is, they might run into some trouble against Arizona. No, oh, I got you. Yeah, I, I look, I think Arizona, I, I'm probably with you on thinking that they win this game. It's going to be, you know, in the middle of the day or whatever. Um, and I just, if BYU wins this one, then I think, the attitude changes on what BYU yeah. is, but right now it still feels like this is one of those deals where Arizona, I don't know. I, I don't want to quit them all the way yet. Like they, no. I don't know. Last week was really bad and disheartening for them um, because you shouldn't lose that game. I think they're just going to be up and down all year. They're, yeah. they, they're a team that has the ability to be anyone and lose to anyone. Yeah, no, absolutely. And this seems like the perfect kind of big 12 upset yep. type of game. Uh, so I, I would side with Arizona here with you as well. All right. Later on in the day, West Virginia and Iowa State, number 11 Hard Cyclones game. on the road. Uh, that's under a field goal spread right now with the Cyclones favored by two and a half. This is another one where, look, Iowa State, I think we know the entire season now, they're probably going to linger towards the top of the standings. Yeah. But this is for West Virginia, what BYU essentially has, where it's a home game against an okay-ish team and see what you can go ahead and do. And if you win it, then we got to talk about you a lot differently than we thought we were going to have to. I think Iowa State's, when they say defense travels, right? Iowa State is a really good defense. West Virginia is still, to the most part, in my opinion, one-dimensional, makes it easier for a good defense. I'll take the clones close, but if the crowd, because that's a night game in Morgantown, and they're, they feel like they're right back in the Big 12 race, if it affects their offense enough, the Iowa State offense enough to where they cause turnovers, then you're talking about something different. If Iowa State takes care of the ball, I think their defense wins them the game. Yeah, I I think Iowa State probably wins this one. This is this is kind of like the the toss up scenario here. Uh, K State and Iowa State, I think, are in similar positions this week, where more people are going to say that it's probably more likely that they win. Like that's the safer play to say that the better team wins that game. But you can't say with certainty, and neither team should feel very comfortable about their situation going into it. They've got tricky opponents, um, but I, I think Iowa State probably wins this game. I they're just they're going to probably play safer and smarter than West Virginia, and Iowa State's not going to run the ball very well uh, in this game because that's just not who they are. So if West Virginia can really frustrate them and make Iowa State go out and kind of have a game like they did against North Dakota to start the season where they only scored like 20 points or against Iowa where they were just non-existent offensively in the first half and then they busted out with some big plays in the second half, then West Virginia is going to have a chance here. Um, but Iowa State's the better team. And we also saw West Virginia, I mean, it took a little bit of a miracle to, to pull off their home win against KU, um, which doesn't look as impressive. That's like now. every KU game, though, so I'm not going to penalize them too much. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> So, all right, that is your Big 12 scoreboard for the week, everything that is going on inside the Big 12 this weekend. All right, we move on and we close things out, talking K-State Colorado one final time here, and we go around and give who we think is the MVP of the game for K-State on both offense and defense if they are to get the win, and then our score prediction for the game. So I ask you first here because – 
It's probably the most intriguing part about this. K-State wins. Who is their defensive MVP? If they win, the defensive MVP is, oh, yeah, I, I, I just worry about this team a little bit. I, I would think a linebacker because they got to get stuff done in the red zone a little bit, either getting their hand on a ball or plugging the run. I will say Desmond Purnell. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I can I like it with the, the linebacker pick, um, but I just think like you know you're going to get tested through the air. Somebody in the secondary has to step up and and be that guy. And and this is weird too because I don't have necessarily the confidence in K State right now, and I'm looking at them and and saying they need to prove it to me that they can do this. Uh, but at least in this, this is the hypothetical of if they win. So I'm thinking of a guy that has been pretty lackluster this year, and especially in coverage, and you're talking about trying and, and prevent them from really bombing it deep on you. But I think that there may be scenarios where they try to force something. This has to kind of be the the do or die game for Jordan Riley, I think, because he's kind of been the guy that's been caught in the crosshairs of a lot of miscues that have hurt this team in the big play department. You think of against Tulane and BYU, like he's got to be locked in and ready to go in this game. So I think if K-State is able to win this game and kind of do what they want to on defense, he probably ends up stepping up and probably playing his best game of the year. Um, and, you know, he, he almost had an interception against Oklahoma State, but didn't. So same, not to the extent of Marquis Siegel, because Marquis Siegel is still doing a lot of good things to impact the team last season. Um, I think Jordan Riley, it's been to a much lesser extent this year. But when the opportunities are there, you got to find a way to take advantage of them. So I, I will go with Jordan Riley on the defensive side. I like it. I just I don't think it's going to be anyone from the secondary, even in a win. I think it's like do less bad. That's yeah. why the Dika dunk. I like that. Yeah. All right. Uh, offensively, where are you going for K State in this game? I there are probably really only two ways to go here. Avery. So, yeah, Avery, because. You could go offensive line because if offensive line controls the line of scrimmage and they just run all over Colorado, that could decide the game. So I'm okay with that. But I say Avery Johnson. You got one, you got to take care of the ball. And two, I do think his legs become a factor in this one, especially Colorado does so much man coverage. What's the thing with man coverage? You have your back to the offense a lot. Yeah, that's true. Um, I will go with Avery as well because I think – more likely than not, the defense will put him in a situation where he's got to kind of go out and be the guy and lead this offense and, and answer and go blow for blow with what Colorado is going to end up doing. So I, I go with Avery Johnson. I, I guess if you're you're going that in too, you would probably say, hey, somebody in the receiving game needs to probably step up too. But Avery's going to be able to have the opportunity to do things through the air, and also his legs should be an important part of this game. So Avery Johnson's the easy pick there. Uh, and in most games, Avery Johnson would be a, a good answer, but I think this is the one where he is specifically the right answer. All right, prediction time. K-State didn't win on the road at BYU, eked one out on the road against Tulane. I know that people on our boards are concerned about K-State and uh, their road performances over the last handful of trips for Chris Kleiman and Joe Klanderman and how they've kind of coached things. Uh, where do you stand on what happens this weekend in Boulder? Yeah, soon after the BYU loss, we lost by 29 points and things really snowballed on Kansas State in those six or seven minutes of game time. I wrote and spoke often about, excuse me, about not being able to skip the steps of growing up. This is another step. I, I think, <coughs> go ahead. <laughs> uh, D.Y. trying to get himself ready uh, after, uh, about with illness this week uh, to get going. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you think a little bit harder on this one. I, I'm torn here on what to do because all week it's kind of this is a put up or shut up type game for K State. They have to go out and prove that they can do this and and overcome everything that they've had and go against them in the BYU game and prove that they're just really mature enough to handle going out and getting a win on the road. And this is a tough situation because Colorado is really talented in, in some spots and especially in a spot that is is going to kind of expose one of your weaknesses. 
But at the end of the day, and this is, you know, I know that the, the Dion fanboys that watch this are going to, are going to com- complain about it and call us haters and, and call us idiots and other names and everything. But Colorado is performing fine this year. Four and one, that's a good start for them. They're two and oh in Big 12 play. But they lost 28 to 10 to Nebraska, who's an okay team. And then what else have you done? You beat North Dakota State, an FCS opponent, by five points. And this is not North Dakota State from 10 years ago. This is current day North Dakota State. That's like, eh, you know, they're they're pretty solid, like top 10 program in the FCS ranks, but they're not the most dominant team in their division anymore. And then I showed the Big 12 standings earlier. Look at where the other wins have come for Colorado this year against UCF, who is one and one in Big 12 play, three and two, and just got throttled by a not very solid Florida team. And then Baylor, who's 0 3 in league play and might be the worst team in the league. So I think I go K State in this one because my head tells me that I should go with K State in this one. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry about that. Whew. Uh, that's what being sick all week can do for you when you're trying to really push it on a Thursday, I guess, on, on your third show. What I would say is, like, I think Kansas State learns and grows up enough. Um, like you said, you can't skip the steps to growing and maturing and developing as a team, especially for those that are inexperienced on the offensive side of the ball like K-State. We saw that against BYU. So I think they take that next step to where they now know how to compete. They know how to stay in a fight. But can they win in an environment and like that? I think that's like the next step that you can't skip. I think Colorado wins a close one, 33-27. Yeah, my score, I I take – here's the deal. My head says K-State 38, Colorado 28. My my feel and my gut says Colorado 34, K-State 20. And I know that's not really a real answer. So I'll go with the the analytically and the the data that would suggest to us that K State should probably win this game. Um, and look, I, I think Chris Kleiman is a great coach. I think Avery Johnson is a great quarterback. I think that this team is going to overcome it. And it's just really tough to envision them basically having a repeat of the BYU game, which is essentially what would have to happen for them to lose to Colorado this weekend. I think not necessarily the flukiness of the turnovers, but also like the K State cannot turn the ball over in this game, and they could still have an outcome similar to BYU because. They're not as sharp or they do some things wrong. Um, They have to prove that they can get this done. And I I think Colorado has a very good chance to win this game. But at the end of the day, it's really tough to to fully respect a team that needed a Hail Mary to go to overtime against Baylor at home and then beat them there. And also needed a ball to be punched out at the half yard line to not go to another overtime with Baylor in that game. And then, yeah, congratulations, you beat UCF, who's a a dumpster fire this year and everything else. So it's just – it's very tough picking this game because I think there are are two sides pulling at it on what could happen for K-State. And this is why – I mean, this is probably going to end up being the defining game of K-State's season. If K-State wins this game, they set themselves up to fully be back into probably driver's seat B behind Iowa State – to go to the Big 12 championship game in Arlington. If they lose this one, we really have to start considering that this K-State team, their peak is going to be like 8-4, and 7-5 and five this season, which would be a pretty significant disappointment given the way that the schedule shaped up and what we thought that they should be this year. So they have to step up. And honestly, if K-State loses this game, you have to question a lot of people uh, involved with this team, whether that be coaching or some of the players like, they would just be – people don't have it because K-State is the better football team than Colorado. But if they don't show it and they lose, then they've got something that's holding them back because they're the more complete team. Um, Colorado is probably the more talented team. But I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it ends up playing out on Saturday. It's going to be fascinating dissecting it uh, by the time the game ends uh, after midnight central time. Yeah, I'm, I'm very intrigued. Uh I don't have a lot of conviction about the final score either. So I'm right yeah. there. I, it, it could go either way. I think this is the most toss up game that K State has played in a while where I don't feel great one way or the other. And, and look, there have been games that I've been wrong on, but they, you know, for different reasons. Uh, going into them, though, like 
there's well, some we're wrong with BYU. Patron. Yeah, wrong with BYU. Yeah. yeah, it was wrong wrong with BYU, but like you know, I think we all had kind of the thought process that K State was going to go to Tulane and it would be a little bit more of a struggle than what people wanted. I think a lot of people I know had the consensus of kind of think K State wins big against Oklahoma State yep. the the last time out. And then you can even go back to last year and you can find some other games where like you know, I don't think – I mean, K-State outperformed in their loss to Texas, but I think we all thought that they would lose at Texas the way things were trending going into that game um, and, and so many others. Like, you can have the game where you don't expect it to happen. This one, I think a lot of people going into it expect this to be a close game that could really go either way, and I think it's probably going to bear out like that on Saturday. So – We'll see how it ends up looking for everybody. Uh, but that will do it for us today. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching the KSO Show. If you want more coverage from K-State Online, go to On3. You can find us there and uh, become a member if you're not already at KSO to get all the inside info that you want on the Cats going into the game. Also, recruiting updates. And as a reminder, later on tonight, we are going to be in Goodland to watch Lincoln Cure, the Cats five-star tight end uh, commit. We'll talk to him get some highlights from his game against Colby and everything else that you want to know there. So that will do it for us. Again, Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. We'll talk to you again on Saturday night, Sunday morning, after the Cats take on the Buffaloes for the first time in well over a decade.